Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, the last one I did, I didn't use video. And then I attended one that had video and I thought it was actually kind of strengthened the presentation. So hopefully it's not too distracting to see both me and the content. Um, very informal. I'm going to present you with all the information and I'm happy for you to write questions in the chat box. Uh, and I will just keep a note of them. If I know that I'll be addressing them in a later time of the presentation, I will hold off just to keep the flow. But if I do think that it's something that needs further clarification or I can address or kind of paraphrase, I'm happy to kind of revisit it for you. So I see a lot of people on, which is great. This is um, a very hot topic for people with Parkinson's, all neurological conditions. And the presentation I'm doing today is actually adapted from a presentation that I did through the Brain Wellness Program, which is an initiative through the Center for Brain Health. And initially, myself and my coworker, Denise Kendrick, who is an occupational therapist working with multiple sclerosis in the MS clinic, we decided that there was too many questions about driving and it would probably be very well received to disseminate the information to everyone that accesses Center for Brain Health. So we developed a presentation called Considerations for Driving with Neurological Conditions. And one of the things that I've done is taken that and put a little bit more specific focus on Parkinson's. The reason why something like this webinar through PSBC is excellent and, and very well, you know, appreciated for, for the clinical standpoint is that often driving gets overlooked. So people are fearful to bring that up with their neurologist. They also don't have very much room in their occupational therapy sessions because often people are referred to occupational therapy for difficulty with function. And that includes getting dressed and bathing and toileting and eating and writing and using the computer. There's lots of different areas of OT management. So driving isn't really a reason we get referred clients. Um, but we play a very pivotal role in being one of the essential disciplines that is required to report if someone has safety, lack of safety, or it has some difficulties with driving that we feel would put them at risk. So we do play a role in screening for driver and safety and informing the medical team uh, whether it would be advisable to follow through. One of the other things I feel like is very important for occupational therapy is often to educate people on the process. So because it's forever changing and because we are mandated within our scope to notify if we feel someone's unsafe, we do need to keep up with the ever-changing body of knowledge and the ever-changing guidelines through Road Safety BC, who are the governing body for people to obtain and maintain their licensing. So Road Safety BC, I'll get into a bit more. Um, it is the new name for the OSMV, the Operator's Service Motor Vehicle. So Road Safety BC is what we use now. So you'll hear me at that, use that throughout the session. All right, so I think we're probably everyone has joined. Um, that was a bit of background about kind of who I am. Just a, a, bit, a brief who I am. I work in brain injury populations for three days a week. And I work in Parkinson's populations two days a week. So I have the, the neurological across the spectrum, specializing in Parkinson's in the movement disorder clinic at UBC and I'm um, doing some research. So we'll get started here. So the outline of what I'm gonna talk about today is essential components for driving, consideration of risk, safe driving, I'm going to explain the process of assessment, technology and safety, and also leave you with some resources that you can look up at your own time. The driving dilemma. And as I prefaced this webinar with, it is a very loaded, emotionally driven conversation that comes up in the clinic. And that's because it enables independence and community mobility. It supports a sense of identity and competence. For people, there's a perceived stigma of losing your license. It's important for maintaining quality of life. It's a worry to burden loved ones for transport. And there's lack of confidence in taking transit. Um, specifically to Parkinson's, there's a big scheduling. A lot of what I do is help people with their scheduling. So if you have very clear on and off states that cycle with your medication, you might not want to get stuck taking transit when you're at risk of being frozen. So there's a lack of confidence in being out in the community if you feel like your medication 
routine isn't quick enough to get you on and take the bus. So a lot of people I work with don't want to take transit, even if they carry something like a short acting cinemat with them, uh, fast acting, because they feel that it's the stress of timing everything, like perhaps if they miss a bus to get home, then they've extended past their on state. And there's fear about people managing in the community. Um, that, you know, their functional mobility might not be safe past a certain time frame. So people want to retain their license for many reasons. But for Parkinson's, it's also a sense of control over timing. So if you want to be somewhere and you schedule your day for activity for an hour, you know that you can go drive there, you can participate, attend, and then you can leave and not extend past that on window. Um, I'll go through kind of a little bit more around the sense of identity and competence, but I have a feeling I'm I'm preaching to the choir and many people on the phone are their loved ones of people with Parkinson's or people that have Parkinson's themselves. And they very much identify with the sense of independence. Um, if you're retired, it's a really easy way to get active in the community. And there's lots of barriers with people that feel like they're going to lose their license because they won't be able to access some of the things that bring them joy or you know, maintain their quality of life. So essential com components of driving, vision, hearing, cognition, sensation, motor functions, and medications. So I'll go through those very briefly. Um, with vision, obviously it's a sensory input and there's things like visual acuity that everyone is, is dependent for everyone to drive safely. Some people have a restriction on their license. So for example, I wear corrective lenses. So I have a restriction that I need to be wearing a corrective lens while driving. So vision is a pretty well known restriction on the license that many of us on the chat might have today. Uh, hearing is another sensory input. And of course, you can understand that all of these relate to safety. Um, there are people do drive with hearing loss. So there are ways to compensate for people that have difficulty or, or, or hard of hearing. Cognition, you know, we'll go a little bit further into that, but related to Parkinson specifically, cognition refers to dual task. So being able to safely attend to one aspect, for example, the light, and then being able to divide your attention between something, including potentially reading a road sign. So that's dual task. You have to keep both of those in their forefront because they're both required to safely execute driving. Sensation, a um, little bit more in, in other populations when you're looking at people that have altered sensation. And that kind of deals with, um, do you know where your hand placement is? Do you know where your foot is? Do you have that proprioceptive feedback to know where your body is in the car? Motor function, so that's if you're dealing with a lot of people with Parkinson's that I see have difficulty with rotation in their trunk. And that's very important for, you know, obviously shoulder checking and making sure that you have a good range of vision of the cars around you. Um, a lot of times people with Parkinson's have bradykinesia, which is slowed movement, and that might also impact motor function. So slowed movement impacting reaction time. Also motor functions can be tremor, so difficulty with placement of hand and space relating to, um, you know, not very refined movements from a tremor disorder and medications. So medication specifically, uh, what I see most of people with Parkinson's is the on and off states. So around when they're going to go on and how long they have before they go off. So the medication, the proximity of when they take their medication and when they're planning to drive. I'm going to consciously slow down a little bit. So please feel free to write anything in the box. Um, it's all kind of an overview at this time. I will be getting into the nitty gritty of what the actual process looks like here in BC, but of course, feel free to add anything to the chat window. So visual perceptual component. And as you hear these, I'd like you to think about your own personal identification as a person with Parkinson's driving and what might be something that you struggle with or what might be something that you feel might be a concern for you with safe driving. So visual perceptual component, this is things like scanning, depth perception, contrast sensitivity, visual acuity, and perception. So for example, this is your ability to observe lines on the road or identify hazards in poor weather or at night. Your ability to check across traffic in full left 
and write visual fields. Your ability to judge distancing. So where to stop and where to start. So that's that depth perception. Are you able to look at the light turning and translate that into when you need to actually execute a movement with your leg to get on the gas or brake to stop safely? And your ability to identify hazards and traffic signs. So that's pretty intuitive. Um, just try to integrate whether you think that's something that might be a challenge for you in your unique process. The physical component. So these are things like coordination, sitting balance, strength, reaction time, and range of motion. So operating a vehicle uses your arms and your legs and often bilateral, meaning both left and right, regardless of whether it's an automatic or a standard. I have a lot of people move from using a uh, standard to an automatic because of the safety and the difficulty with one other demand. So, um, you know, the, the first thing to go is typically if someone's driving a standard vehicle, they feel safer in an automatic because it eliminates a motor response that's required. Um, you have to complete hand over hand steering. You need trunk stability for in using your controls and staying position when you're driving around corners, for example. Some people have one side more impacted than the other. If there's a big disparity in the strength or weakness, uh, as you turn a corner, you might find yourself following where the corner turns. Um, so quick responses in emergency situations, being able to physically move fast enough to respond to the situation, transferring in and out of a car, um, and including both getting in and out of a car, but also loading any mobility devices that you might have. So walkers, canes, activator poles, being able to load those and then safely access them to be able to get out of the car and rotation for shoulder checks and peripheral scanning. So those are the physical components that are specific to Parkinson's that we, that we look for. Cognitive components, so making decisions at the speed of traffic, deciding who has the right of way, so being able to integrate some pen and paper information that you may have done when you tried you know did your learners or did you know years ago when you passed your driver's license um, being able to understand that you yield to the right and then how does that actually play out when you come to a roundabout or you come to a four-way stop defensiveness driving to avoid hazards being able to make in moment judgments attending to and shifting between stimuli and that was the example i introduced around reading a sign um, in contrast to also looking at the lights and perceiving what color it is. Planning and following a route, so your working memory, your ability to retain information as you're distracted through driving, and obeying traffic rules and integrating new information. So for example, you want to be sure that if there is a change, uh, one of the big examples I use is that um, I'm not from BC, and here in BC they have green flashing lights. And I don't know if anyone on the phone or on the webinar is from Manitoba, but the green flashing light means very something very different in Manitoba than it does in BC. So cognition means your ability to integrate changes both, you know, between bylaws, but also if something changes, are you able to take that and integrate it? So in in Manitoba, a green light that flashes means right away for a left turn. And here in BC, it means it's a pedestrian control, meaning that a pedestrian will touch the button and it will turn to yellow and red because it's controlled by the pedestrian. So um, yeah, I just there's just a note from Jillian that says we are from Ontario and the green flashing light was something we had to learn too. So those examples, I mean, obviously geographically, if you're moving around and there's different signs and stimulus, um, that's one thing, but also if things get updated or changed your ability to take that all, integrate it, and then safely drive. Auditory component, so responding to sirens and emergencies, localizing sounds with respect to your position, understanding the meaning of sounds, and that ties into cognition. So hearing something, processing it, and then integrating what it means and what action you need to have. And then feedback to cognitive, for example, um, some people are quite forgetful and they'll leave their indicator, indicator light on post turning if it doesn't automatically click off. Can you hear the indicator clicking and then respond because that's your cue, hey, you forgot to turn off the indicator? Or can you 
listen to direction assist and do you have the cognitive capacity to follow the map as laid out by the auditory assist um, or is that too distracting and it ends up being compromising safety so it's very individual as far as um, what is a strategy that helps and what needs to be eliminated to improve safety sensory component and I did talk a little bit more about this relating to other neurological conditions um, that being said, if some people have differentiated weakness left and right, or sometimes early on in Parkinson's disease, um, it's, a, it's not bilateral. They notice that one side is more impacted than the other. One side either has a, a high amplitude movement and the other doesn't, or one side has slower movement and rigidity than the other one doesn't, or one side is weaker and the other one isn't. So we're looking at kind of that, the difference in the inequality between left and right, and then which side you're using um, as your power hand for steering, which leg you're using to alternate between brake and gas. Um, so that all goes into consideration. Of course, it's a very individualized assessment. Um, so sensory component is also determining pressure for gas and brake, feedback for positioning of hands and feet without looking. Um, I had a client say, well, if I don't know exactly where the foot pedal is because I don't have great sensory in my feet, I can just look. Um, it doesn't necessarily work like that because if you are taking your eyes off the road enough to look down at your feet, um, you're compromising your visual input. So we kind of need to figure out a strategy that doesn't decrease your overall safety. Um, and, and typically there's not a loss in sensory input with Park a true Parkinson's. So we're not looking necessarily at that so much as usually your sense, your, sen your sensory system contributes to your positioning of you can reach down and feel your gear shift. And instead of looking at it and saying, oh, I'm, I'm holding it, your brain can make sense of what you're touching through kind of a stereognostic, which means holding something with your vision occluded. You can hold it and make sense of what it is without having to look at it. So we wanna make sure you still have that sense of sensory strength. Um, and so, yeah, just reaching for gears and dashboard controls. And I, I think you very often don't look at your gears if you're putting on your windshield wipers. You don't look at your indicator when you're putting it on. And maybe, th maybe think through what you do in the car. And if you do, um, think about why that might be that you're doing that. So often we're not actually using our vision, we're using our sensory input to basically validate our motor movement. So we're moving, finding the indicator, and then when we get hold of it, we're verifying that that's correct by sense of, sense of uh, touch versus by vision. So medication considerations, uh, we spoke about symptom fluctuation with dosing. Um, there is a, a high component of a side effect of visual hallucinations um, when some people are trying to get used to their medication dose. Some people, that's part of their disease process. So we always have to be mindful of visual hallucinations. Um, you know, there's the, the token story is someone that is experiencing visual hallucinations and sees maybe a small animal like a rabbit on the side of the road and then responds with with moving quickly out of the way of the rabbit. And we need to make sure that that's either you, if you have a visual hallucination and you understand that that's what it is and you're not just stressed by it and it's not gonna change your behavior, it's very different than someone having a visual hallucination and being fearful of it and responding in behavior to it. Um, so of course, if you have those, it doesn't mean you can't drive, of course. It means that's a consideration in your safe driving process. Tone management. So some people are very, very rigid and very slow moving. Um, and then they free up quite a bit depending on which medication they're on. And this one spans across most neurological conditions too. And then sleepiness and sleep attacks. I'm not very familiar with sleep attacks with Parkinson's. Uh, I've only met a couple people that have very kind of sudden onset somnolence, which is just falling asleep. Um, it's not narcolepsy, it's specific to the neurological disorder they have. Um, so I, I'm not as comfortable with it, but I do know some people that have self-reported sleep attacks or sleepiness, uh, and that ties into the medications that they're on. So as I say these, I want you to think about whether any of these appear, basically are any of these stick out to you as something that resonates with you. And of course it's all anonymous, so you don't need to type anything or say anything, but just listen to it and maybe kind of 
think, does that apply to me? So I only feel comfortable driving during the day. I have trouble remembering where I put the keys. I frequently forget where I'm going or how to get there. I often feel too tired to drive, but I do so anyways. I sometimes get confused between the gas and the brake. I'm not comfortable driving others. And one of the, you know, non-clinical questions we ask, and it kind of, it was brought to me by a client that I was seeing in the clinic is, uh, she came in and said, I'm not driving my grandkids anymore. And I didn't impose that. My children have asked me not to drive the grandkids. So then we kind of broke apart. Well, to me, that's them, that's them expressing concern. If they're putting parameters on when you drive and who you drive, then let's unpack that and figure out what their what their concerns are. So driving others, it might be, you know, driving grandkids at night. It might be driving first thing before your, your medication takes effect. So it's always very, um, it's variable for everyone, but driving others is a kind of a big first flag indicator for people. I have trouble concentrating when the radio or GPS is on. I do not want to discuss driving with my doctor because they'll make me stop. And hopefully that's why there's a big turnout today because people want to you know, be educated and be informed and know that it's not as scary as it sounds. The doctors at the clinic are also very, very comfortable with this topic. Um, I've had multiple traffic violations or accidents. My arms and legs don't always listen to what my brain tells them to do behind the wheel. So that's that piece of what we call motor apraxia, which is difficulty in executing a movement as directed by your brain. So you're saying, okay, time to switch your leg over to the brake. And there's either a delay in your body processing that command or your body hears it. It pulls your foot off, but it can't figure out to move it over and put it on the brake. So it listens to the command, but it can't complete the task. To, it doesn't go to completion. How can I remain a safe driver? So the first thing is, I mean, you guys are not the ones that, that need to be encouraged because you're all here learning today. There's a big body of people that I think are, are fearful of this topic that don't want to learn about it in fear that it will create some ripple effect of getting an assessment. Um, so the biggest thing is discuss your driving. Discuss it with your doctor, your healthcare professional, as well as your family and friends. Take some of those red flags that I reviewed, which is uh, sometimes I get confused with the messaging from my body to brain around where to put my hands. Sometimes laterality, so left versus right, becomes an issue with neurological conditions. Uh, again, less incidence in Parkinson's, but so you have your dominance left and right, and then you might get confused which one needs to move to put the windshield wipers on or which one needs to move to put the indicator on. So that's an example of laterality confusion. Um, reflect on your driving. Assess your body, including your physical cognitive changes relating to your condition. And with Parkinson's, this means throughout the day. So we know that there's huge fluctuations in functional status throughout the day. Um, and you guys are, are your best experts in knowing how your body moves and how it listens. Uh, when it doesn't and what your higher risk times are. So you'll be asked about when you reflect on the driving, just be mindful of uh, when you get when you renew your license, you will be asked, have you had a change in your health status? And that is uh, an honors system of you saying, I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's. So again, I don't know if any of you have come across the renewal process. Some clients I work with say, yeah, they asked me and I said, I've got Parkinson's and, and nothing came of it. And some people uh, don't know they should disclose, so they don't disclose. Um, it's always in your best interest to disclose. Ask for an assessment. Be safer than sorry. Ask for an assessment if you consider yourself at risk for any of those areas that I mentioned might be a challenge. Be open to options. So stay flexible with options for driving and work with your family and support systems to make sure you're able to, main, to manage access in the community. That goes back to that sense of autonomy and sense of quality of life and being able to engage in valued activities um, without having to feel like you're a burden on family for driving. So general, very general, of course we can't go into specific for individuals here, but just very general safe driving tips include 
after walking to the car, rest for a few minutes before driving to manage any physical or cognitive fatigue. So basically give yourself a moment to reset. Do a check-in before you're driving, asking yourself, how do I feel? For Parkinson's, that might include when was my last pill? And for those of you that don't have very dramatic on and off states, then this might not apply for, apply to you, but it's still really important to think about where you are in your dosing. So do a check-in before driving. Ask yourself, how do I feel? Reduce distractions. So turn off your radio, avoid conversations with passengers, turn off Bluetooth for any calls that might be coming in. Plan your route and look it over if you're going somewhere new. So this is the kind of stop, check in with yourself, develop a plan, develop some problem solving. If you get lost, are you going to pull over? Are you going to wing it? So just kind of get a plan before you start the car and get going. Pull over for a break if you're going longer distances. Ensure you're sitting comfortably and have very good visual access. Bring a family member or friend along for support and feedback. Plan out your day to avoid driving during rush hour and drive during non-peak hours if at all possible. Be aware of your medication routine and how it may impact your ability to drive. And we reviewed the impact that drowsiness and motor control have on your safe driving. Check the weather and make sure the conditions are not a factor in your safety. So those are very general principles that you can start doing today. So this is very small. I'm only realizing that now that it's actually on the screen. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I think I'll, I, you will get a copy of the handouts and the, the, the presentation is being recorded. So don't fear if you can't read it. But what this is, is it's a schematic of the process of a driver's assessment. So what actually happens? So this is specific to BC, it's specific to its current, so it's, it's right now what the process is. And as I mentioned, it's kind of, it evolves and it's a bit more dynamic than, than people feel it should be. But um, there's recently been a very big move in assessing people with disabilities or assessing people that are over 80 um, for driving. And so this is the most current information as of 2020. So basically what happens is anyone can report someone as being unsafe. It can be a family member, it can be a doctor, it can be your GP, your specialist, your occupational therapist, um, it can be anyone. So basically what you do is there's a form and usually it's in a conversation with your doctor. So you might in the doctor's office um, fill out a, a brief screen on your thinking skills. Um, that might include some working memory, some alternating attention, and they might do it with you as a, a, a you know baseline. So you might see your GP every, you know, whatever, six months or your specialist. And if there's concerns around changes in your thinking, they might be administering uh, a screen that looks at your thinking skills. Those are commonly going to be a MOCA, the Montreal Assessment for Cognitive Function, or the MMSC, the Mini Mental Status Exam. So those are typically done in GP's offices. Our neurologists, um, because they're specialized in Parkinson's, uh, might not do it as much because they have a very good sense of kind of the, who you are and what your disease process looks like. Um, so if any of you have had that test, um, that might lead to a conversation around there's some differences in the way that you're thinking as compared to when you came in last. And those differences might impact your driving. So they would fill out a report to Road Safety BC, who is the governing body out of Victoria. And the report would say, basically, I'm not sure, but I have concerns. What do you think? So it would be medical information. It would be um, things around your vision and hearing and just basically an over, a snapshot of who you are and what initiated the referral. Road Safety BC is the decision maker. So they get that form and they decide what to do with it. And this is all, all in, the, in, this, in the schema here, but I realize it's very small. So they could say, this person's medically fit, no problem write you a letter and say, we have no concerns at this point, we will be in touch if we do. End of story. They could say, we need more information. And they could send a driver medical evaluation form to the person that referred. If the person that referred was a family member, it would go to the GP. So they basically find the most responsible practitioner um, and they send them a form, a driver medical evaluation record. And that's a more comprehensive review of your status. Then they fill that out and send it back. The third option is that they determine, Road Safety BC determines that they don't need more information. 
but that you need to go for a test. And there are a few different kinds of tests that they might request you go for. And this is the part that's new. So this has changed. Um, they've introduced what's called an enhanced road assessment. And that is new as of March 2019. Before that, there used to be something which you may have heard of called Drive Able. And Drive Able was the thing that everyone got sent for. There's no longer, um, Drive Able still exists, but it's no longer viewed by Road Safety BC as a standard for reviewing safety and driving. So if someone says, go get Drive Able, make sure you talk to one of your healthcare workers because that's not relevant and recent recommendation. Drive Able, you can pay privately if you find yourself with a surplus of, of money and curiosity about your driving state, you can pay and go to get Drive Able. Road Safety BC will not recognize the results of Drive Able. So again, it's not, don't put your money there unless you have enough money to, to put there. <laughs> um, so the options now are, there's two options that come of the form. Hopefully you can see this a little bit, a little bit clearer. So we talked about the report coming from either a citizen, a family member, a medical professional. Sorry, I, I left out the police by accident. So that's, for example, if you get into an altercation or, um, you know, a fender bender accident and then someone reports you. So, of course, that can come through the police as well. Basically, anyone can raise you to the attention of Road Safety BC saying, I don't think this person's safe. So basically, Road Safety BC makes that determination. And this is that last part um, of the of the visual in the bottom there where I talked about the three options. One of them is you're medically fit. Keep your license. Go ahead. You're not medically fit. And if you do get that letter saying you're not medically fit at this time, typically included in that is instructions of either a point of reevaluation or a point of either if you would like to appeal or it also tells you to go and exchange your license for a BC ID at the local ICBC. So basically, when you get the letter, they're going to explain what needs to be done in that letter. Um, and they're unique to everyone. I mean, I've had some clients that have, um, that they're recommended, they had DUIs and they have to take a course that costs. So they, they, they lay it out specific to your situation. There's no template. They take everything very specific to who you are and what your needs are. Um, and so then the, the other outcome is that we need more information and we're going to send you for a test. Now, this is, if, if anything that you remember from the seminar is, it should be this. If Road Safety BC requests you get tested, they pay for it. If you get tested, you pay for it. So unless Road Safety BC is involved in sending you for an enhanced road assessment or sending you for a functional driver evaluation, which I'll explain in a moment, if they request it, they pay for it and it's pricey. If they don't request it, and a lot of people don't want Road Safety BC involved because they say, I don't want to get flagged because if I get flagged, then I'm on their system and they know my license and I'm, I'm fearful of what that looks like. Be mindful if they don't sanction it you can't you pay for it privately and it's around eighteen hundred dollars to start so i'll just let that sit for a second and go to the next slide so i, I spoke about the enhanced road assessment the new as of march 2019 so one of the outcomes is they say yeah we need you to go and get tested go to an enhanced road go get an enhanced road assessment Right now, these are on hold because of COVID. There's no safe way for someone to administer an enhanced road assessment in a car. There's not enough uh, physical distancing space. Um, they're, they're experiencing a pretty big backlog. So if you are someone attending this webinar that is waiting for an enhanced road assessment, um, I can appreciate that it probably is, has been quite a wait because they have not done them since March and they don't have a process to open them quite yet. So the enhanced... The, the enhanced road assessment has three outcomes. You either say, yeah, after that assessment, we've determined you can drive. Keep your license. See you either if someone else reports you, if we tell you we want to see you in six months or a year, or once you turn 80, 
everyone gets on the radar of Road Safety BC. So once you turn 80, you're going to get something in the mail saying, we understand you've turned 80. Um, I've had a lot of clients say they wish that there was a congratulations, like you're 80, happy birthday also, but it's, it's not quite as friendly. It's you're 80 and there might be changes in your driving. Here's what we need from you. Um, so anyways, otherwise, the outcome of an enhanced road assessment could be that your driver's license is canceled. So Road Safety BC will cancel your license. Switch it in for BCID, and there might be uh, some directions or parameters on either appealing it or when you could get retested, depending on the outcome. The other thing is they say, well, you didn't pass, you didn't fail, we need more information. So they might say, "Come, at, your license is suspended, and we want you to have another enhanced road assessment in six months. They might say the concern was specific to visual, please go to a neuro-ophthalmologist and get a visual scanning test. So it's very specific if they ask for more information, they're really gonna target what was a concern raised in the enhanced road assessment. So if they don't send you for an enhanced road assessment, they might also ask for more information. So all of this is going through likely your GP. If you don't have an active GP, it may go through your specialist um, at the Movement Disorder Clinic, it might go through a neurologist, um, but I think that one of the things that you should do is think through, do I have a GP that knows me and that will be able to fill out this driver medical evaluation form and answer any questions? Um, GPs can bill $75 to fill this out, so there is something built into their billing structure uh, for filling them out because they get, they're quite long and they're a little bit onerous, um, so there is, a, there is a fee structure built in for them. Uh, so th from there, they then get more information and they might say, okay, you can just go and take an ICBC road test. You don't need an enhanced road assessment. You can go, they might say, they might recommend taking private driving lessons. Uh, there are ones that are Road Safety BC approved. So just make sure that if you are looking at taking a private lesson, it's with one of the companies that is sanctioned by Road Safety BC. Um, and they might also say, yeah, we got more information. We feel more comfortable. You can keep your license. We'll see you in a year when we, when we determine at that point what needs to be done. So again, it's always, they're always calling the shots on the timelines um, based on their experience and they're nurse case managers and they are uh, people that work for Road Safety BC. So they're very comfortable with this process. So we've talked a lot about enhanced road assessment and if any of you have gone for them, you can chime in as well. Otherwise, I will tell you a little bit about them so you know what to expect. So Road Safety BC sanctions them. You cannot go pay privately for an enhanced road assessment. You can pay privately for an ICBC. Um, I just see a question. So could you take a road test or an enhanced road test? So yeah, you cannot go in and ask to do an enhanced road assessment unless Road Safety BC has asked you to. They just wanna keep it controlled and not flood. You can go in and take an ICBC road test, like the ones that you would do when you turn, I don't know what the age here is, but 14, 16, you can ask to go in and take a road test and pay for it out of your own curiosity, but you should be mindful that, that all that information goes back to Road Safety BC. Um, and, and I'm not gonna encourage you to go privately because of course they have a duty to report as well, but if you feel you need to take a road test, um, you could do some practice with a private driving school or with a family member you trust. Um, but Road Safety BC is the only, they can only ask for the enhanced road assessment. A doctor can't ask for it. A, I mean, Road Safety BC might listen to your doctor. If your doctor says, I have concerns about this person, to, this person is driving, I think they need an enhanced road assessment. They, they would take that into consideration, but they are the ones that recommend it. So it is conducted in your own vehicle. That is also a change from previous models where you were given a standard vehicle that, that was throughout all testing. So this is in your own vehicle. It's a 90 minute on road evaluation. There is no paper and pen, and that is different than what it used to be. So the paper and pen screens, they're relying on occupational therapists or medical doctors to do in order to inform whether someone needs an enhanced road assessment. It involves ro route reversal and driving skills. So there's a cognitive component where you, in that 90 minutes, um, it's 
not all on the road. There's a piece of it that's on the road and you do need to drive and then reverse the route that you just did. Um, the other thing about it is it's not a secret and everyone thinks it is, but I put a hyperlink here. I don't know if it'll work. Um, I can get Alana to send it out. So basically all the information on what an enhanced road assessment is, what to expect, what it looks like, why you might need one. It's not a secret. It's all very clearly outlined. Um, and I can send the link out. Um, I don't know if Alana, if you have internet, you can maybe open that link and then post it in the chat. So do a little bit of educating yourself on what it is. And that way, if you have to cross this bridge, you'll at least feel a bit more informed. So again, to, to reiterate, the possible outcomes if you get sent for enhanced road assessment are you continue driving, no changes, you need further medical, further medical information is required. That was the example I used of potentially an ophthalmologist to look at your visual scanning or, you know, it could be specific to what, oh yeah, sorry, there you go. Um, there's a post right there. If everyone wants to just either make note of that. So that's what I was saying is everything's online. You just need to know exactly which site to look at. So you can follow that link. Um, the third outcome is that you just continue driving. Switch in your driver's license for a BC ID. The fourth outcome is that you require further assessment through a functional driver evaluation. Which I'll explain right now. So what is a functional driver evaluation? It's administered by an occupational therapist or a certified driver rehab specialist. Uh, just to clarify, I'm an occupational therapist, but I'm not certified in doing the functional driver evaluation. So my role would be to screen and inform the medical team or Road Safety BC of my findings, but people can't come to the clinic for functional driving evaluations. Most of them are actually well, most, if, except for uh, a couple exceptions, are privatized. So the contract goes from Road Safety BC to the private company that is comprised of OTs and certified driver rehab specialists. So this is a one and a half to three hour in office assessment looking at physical, visual, and cognitive abilities. So this is pen and paper. It's more in depth, it's a bit more thorough, and I find as an occupational therapist, uh, I work part-time at GF, as I mentioned. So you at GF Strong, most of my clients are getting functional driver's evaluations because they're protected for people that have more complexity. They're, they're more comprehensive. Um, whereas an enhanced road assessment, I'm finding a lot of my clients at the Parkinson's clinic are being sent for enhanced road assessments because being on the road and driving is the best indicator of your safety in driving. Uh, whereas, um, you know, maybe there's a lot more physical changes. Maybe someone's a quadriplegic or an amputee and there's a lot of different changes that might need the functional driver evaluation. I have not had a client with Parkinson's go for a functional driver evaluation. They've all gone for enhanced road assessments, but that does, that's not a rule. So both of them are, are options. The question is, do they pay for this too? Yes, they do. The functional driver evaluations are not sanctioned by Road Safety BC. So you can go and call up a private driving company, some of the, you know, OT consulting, community therapists, these are clinics that have OTs that do functional driving evaluations and you can pay to get it done. So a circumstance in which you may want to do that is if you are curious about how you would perform. Uh, again, I say let Road Safety BC outline what needs to be done and why. It might, it just gets a bit messy. I, I think that I'm, I, what I'm trying to communicate is if you determine that you want to see how you're doing and go for a functional driver evaluation, um, and it's not including the governing body of Road Safety BC, it's, there's complications to that. So both financially, you'll have to pay for it. And, um, you know, no, you might not want to go and sit for a three hour assessment if no one's going to make you. Um, so anyways, there's a, an in office component and there's also a one hour on road assessment with a focus on functional, safe and practical driving. When people turn 80, they get a form in the mail. We talked about that. 
they might just say, we need more information. We need that drivical medical evaluation record. We need that filled out by your doctor. They might say, based on the fact you have Parkinson's and you're 80, we'd like you to go get an enhanced road assessment. They might say, based on the fact you have Parkinson's and you had an enhanced road assessment two years ago, and we want you to have a functional driver evaluation. So everyone will be contacted when they're 80. And what, what that form says when you get contacted when you're 80 might be dependent on what, ex what previous exposure you've had to road safety BC. So again, the outcomes. So continue to drive, no changes. Rehabilitation is required to drive with potentially any modifications or modifications to your vehicle or habits or feedback. Um, you might have to do like three or four rehabilitation sessions. Those are not covered by Road Safety BC. And those are going to be about 120 an hour. So again, if they ask you to go do the assessment, our advice is let them let them outline what needs to be done. Let them secure the funding for it and then see, see where do you, go, you go from there. I'm not sure about Parkinson's Society BC, but there are some other uh, funders through if, you know, WorkSafe BC or Extended Medical, or there are some other funders that might cover those rehabilitation sessions. Um, and they would probably be with an occupational therapist or a certified driver specialist. And again, the third outcome, as always, is discontinue driving and trade in your BC driver's license for a BC ID. So what are adaptive automobile equipment? What are some examples? You might be looking at, again, this is across neurological, so not specific to Parkinson's, but examples are mechanical hand controls, lateral foot blocks for foot pedals, adapted steering to involve less force, effort, and more sensitivity, introduction of a spinner knob and a modified texture grip for your wheel, wide angle rear view mirrors and multiple angle mirrors, um, I opened today's webinar talking about how people with Parkinson's often have difficulty with rotation in their trunk. A uh, few people I know that are still driving with Parkinson's have a multiple angle mirror where it compensates for a lack of rotation for shoulder check. And in their rear view mirror, there sits a little other mirror and that mirror gives them a different perspective. So they're able to do a more systematic shoulder check by using a multiple angle mirror. And that's a compensatory strategy for uh, reduced range in rotation. Specialized seats to ease transfers in and out of the car. And then of course, extenders like on your indicators, dashboards, seat belts, ways to make it easier for people to manipulate what they need to on their, on their dashboard. So technology and safety, I mean, one thing just to mention is uh, this is not a recommendation, um, but there are a lot of different new types of technology that both decrease your insurance um, and offer you a little bit more safety. So there's things that offer, um, you know, drowsy drive where if they sense that the, that the driver is veering to left or right, they will alert a sound or a vibration. There's lane departure signals. There's smart headlights that turn on and off um, as the time of day changes. And that just takes away the load of you having to do it on your own. There's reverse monitoring, of course, backup cameras, blind spot uh, warnings. So all sorts of beeps and bells and whistles. There's um, forward collision. So there's automatic braking. There's um, assist for parking. And then there's also, um, you know, where, where you're sitting and the car in front of you goes, there's an alert to say time for you to go. So there are lots of things that can compensate. And these are market. These are not made for people with disabilities. These are just new technologies that have come out in cars. They do impact your insurance. And some people think, you know, at this point, I feel less safe than I did five years ago. What of these might be worth me investing in with my family? Like, is it is it worth looking at? A rear view camera because it reduces the demand for rotational shoulder checking when I'm reversing. So any caregivers on the line today um, specifically for you is understand that this is a very sensitive topic and it's sensitive information and you know feedback or input or direction from the right person makes a huge difference. 
uh, observe their driving over time to understand their changes in their driving ability. So you guys know best, we're getting you at a snapshot in time. Um, so someone that's with you might see trends, or they drive less at night, they don't want to drive, um, you know, they take back roads, they never make left turns, you know, that you might see those habits and be able to track them better than us. Look for a pattern of warning signs and an increase in the frequency of occurrences. Um, support in decision making. So how much uh, you know, some people, it's very simple, like thinking about alternate modes of transportation and thinking about maybe the benefit of not having to maintain a car, not having to deal with traffic. Um, you know, how much money could you save if you didn't have to pay insurance? So, you know, all those things are our personal decisions that we re that we recommend that you speak about with your family. Um, also support them in problem solving. So explores ways that the partner can remain engaged in life's activities. So um, maybe it's a modified bike that you can use to go safely in your community. Um, I have a few clients that have an A-linker, which is they use it all the time to get to and from places that are close to them. And then they don't feel that reliance um, to ask someone to drive them. Uh, there's all sorts of ride shares, of course, with COVID not recommended for, for closed spaces, but you know, pre-COVID and eventually at some point post-COVID ride shares like Uber and um, Lyft, those are options too, of course, taxis, transit. Um, so just kind of being creative and helping problem solve and, and making sure that people aren't making the decision to continue driving if they feel unsafe because they're trying to not be a burden on their loved ones. So how do I prepare to stop driving? Practice using transit if you've got, I mean, right now, of course, with caution, um, find ways to reduce your need to drive. So think about ways that you can look at why you drive and can any of those be eliminated that might actually impact you in a positive way. So grocery delivery, seek support from family and friends, register for Handy Dart. Um, if you don't know what that is, I can explain that. If you do know what that is uh, and you already have it, um, it's just a door-to-door -door service. It has its limitations and that you get picked up in a window and they do they pick up a bunch of clients in the same geographic area. So sometimes you can get picked up and then have to pick up five more people. And then, so it's not the most direct route, but um, it definitely is it, very safe for people that are using mobility devices and you can bring someone on with you. Um, so like I spoke about Uber, Lyft and other rideshare programs, research alternative methods of transportation and explore whether walking, biking or integrating an activity into your day is something that you might be willing to do or feel capable of doing. So I put here a bunch of resources um, and I, I know we've got about five minutes left, so I don't want to open any of the materials for us to review, but I do want to just say that um, once they're provided with you, I do recommend opening some of these resources. Uh, if you get a PDF, you will not be able to click on the link. So maybe um, I can talk to Alana about that after, just making sure. Um, there's specific resources here on Parkinson's and driving. There's dexterity in driving, you know, the same difficulty you have opening your wallet and getting money for the cashier or, you know, doing the buttons on your shirt. That's the same dexterity that you need for some driving tasks. So if you're struggling with some dexterity, there's some resources there for that. Um, there's checklists on am I a safe driver? So it reviews some of the stuff that I mentioned of uh, do I feel like I'm restricting my driving during certain times? And there is uh, information from CAA and there is alternate transit information. Um, and of course, the enhanced road assessment, as it's relatively new, is explained in, in the link there as well. So I just want to say thank you very much. Um, it's a very heavy topic and I feel like that was probably a long hour for some of you. So I apologize if I spoke fast or if not all of it was very clear, but hopefully you leave feeling a little bit more empowered about the driving process 